the NFL to Hollywood to fatherhood. Join me as I tackle my next journey in life, becoming Hollywood's next action star. Got my daughter down for a nap. My son's watching Toy Story 3. Now we can go lift. So today is a push day. I am feeling like doing flat barbell bench because it's been a minute. Something about it is exciting me, so maybe I'll have a good one there. So I'm gonna load it up on the flat barbell bench, do an incline machine press, do a plyometric push-up variation, do a little lateral delts, dust off the arms just a little bit, maybe two, three sets on each, buys and tries. So to this warm-up, with my hands in a regular uh, push-up width uh, at about 10. <clears throat> Widen them out. <clears throat> 10. Diamond. Close grip push ups. Gonna make a diamond with your thumbs and pointer fingers. Not just for the triceps, squeeze at the top, really get the inner chest to fire. And then go again with about the regular push up width. You can get on your knees, push your uh, hands out a little bit, and just this is like a tricep extension kind of movement. <clears throat> Shake it out real quick. And now this is going to be more of a uh, shoulder variation of push-up. So you're going to bring your feet up a little bit. Lean it out forward, hope your hands touch your head. It's 50 reps. Like a good amount of blood is now pushed into those working areas. It's maybe one of the more important pieces to my warm up. A little prehab exercise. Prehab is essentially rehab before you need it. Strengthening an area that may be a little more injury prone, specifically around a joint. Keep it strong. Uh, keep the muscles supporting that joint strong so that you're less likely to get injured in that joint. This is for your rotator cuffs. So this is just 10 pounds here. You can do this on the ground or on a bench. Down, come back up and try not to push this leg out as you're doing it. Trying to get all the work from this interior of your shoulder. Let's throw a little neck in here just at the end of the warm up. I'm trying to hit my neck as often as I can. I said I was going to say every day, but it never happens. It's an easy thing to just skip or forget about. But my biggest lagging areas in my body are my arms, calves, and neck, the extensors of your shirts and shorts. I call them my shirts and shorts muscles. Uh, not extensors, but what extends out. Um, so here goes neck. Today, I will do weighted with a plate. All you need is a beanie and a little weight. I use a 25. It's not something that I um, progressively overload by any means. I'm not trying to eventually get to stacking a, a bunch of plates on my forehead. I'll just do more reps at this or do different exhaustion techniques to burn the muscle out even more. And doing neck for me is so, uh, it so quickly gets monotonous and boring that I, I don't do more than a set each direction each day. And like today, I'm just going to do front and back. Um, and so what I'll do 
is take this 25 and rep it out until I got, you know, maybe no reps left or a couple, and then take a little break, it's burning. Five to 10 seconds later, I'll do a, a few more and repeat that a couple times. Uh, and then switch to the back. My hands are here. It is assisting, but just so that it doesn't fall. So I'm keeping it from falling off my head and then try to keep it to where it keeps the tension on my neck on the contraction. <laughs> going real slow here. I'm not trying to beat any reps from the last time. I'm just trying to keep tension in the muscle. This is the last uh, warm up set before my working sets, which based on how I've been feeling in the warm ups, I'm going to have my first working set be at 365. And there probably won't be many reps, but I just want to crank that out um, and see how many I can get. Generally, on my warm ups for bench, I'm already warmed up. I've done a general upper body war warm up, but I'll do like 135 pounds for 10, then 225 for five. And then past that, I'll do like doubles and singles. So 275 for a double, 315 for a one or two. You know, today I did one, I'll do 340 for one, and that meets the difference between 315 and 365. 365 will be my first set. So let's see how easily I can stroke this one out for a single. That went up pretty good, felt good. Okay. So, that was almost catastrophic. I'm live right now, and it made me forget that I'm not right here. Forgot to turn this one on. I unracked 365 and then thought, oh shoot, that's not on. At least I don't remember turning it on. Should I go? Nah, nah, fam. If it's not on camera, it never happened in this world. Ah, uh, here we go. Come on, baby. Sixty-five. Been a minute since I touched that weight. Uh, was a lot heavier than I wanted it to be, but isn't most weights. Um, so four. That's the starting point for right now. Next time I hit this, I'll try to hit five. It gives me something to push for, and then you know, say four on a rep max sheet is like three sixty-five, three eighty-five, three ninety-five, four oh five to four ten maybe in that range. Four hundred to four ten would be the working max you would work from. And that's honestly how I started lifting. I didn't, I didn't learn from anybody. I was just competing with my, myself, competing my butt off every day and trying to beat my last lift. Because in high school, we had a rep max sheet on the wall. In football, they, they, that's usually how they calculate your maxes. It's not smart it's of any strength coach to make some of the strongest, most fast twitch you know, athletes in the world, you're pay, who you're paying a bunch of money to, to do a single rep on most lifts. You know, you really wanna slap 600 plus pounds on a bunch of these guys' backs, blow out their low back. No, you, you have them rep out 500 pounds. So back when I would do the rep maxes, um, that's where they stopped me in college. I could have kept going. In high school, I repped out 500 pounds for 10, and that gave me a working max of 650. Um, in college, they, they pulled me back, which they do often. You're a great athlete. They don't wanna injure you in the weight room. They need to keep you on the field. So, hey buddy, one sec, I'll be right in there, okay? Thanks bud, be right in. So that's how I started. It would be like, hey, okay, I lifted, I, hit, I got three reps at 185, that said I, I'm a 200 pound bencher now. 
And that fired me up. And then the next time I compete, oh, I've got to get four, got to get four. You work your way up, you know, and then you hit 10 reps. That's 240 pounds. And then you actually kind of go and test it out. It's like, hey, I could hit two plates on the bar for one or two. And that's, that does the, that's the same equation there. So um, don't look to other people. Look to yourself. Beat yourself every day. Try to beat the last time. Be in the gain from your baseline where you started. And then look back constantly to that baseline of how, how far you've come from that point. That gave me in my early lifting years constant. I lived in a state of motivation of just fumes of just imagination of where I could go based on where I'd already come from. It's so powerful. And yet in this day of social media, people can't help. It's a different world than when I was in high school, which wasn't crazy long ago. It's a completely different world because they're just bombarded with comparison every day. Everybody's highlight reel and you get to see all the talent in the world instead of just at your high school or your district of football players. And uh, there's some really good things to that too. It's not all negative. You know, you can see where the bar is. Uh, I should probably move this over here too. But you, you can see now that the bar is raised, like there's more competition out there. There's levels that are even more achievable than where you're at, even for your age group. So it's like, oh shoot, I can push myself harder. This is achievable. You know, it makes me think of the first guy to break into the fours, was it on the, on the mile or was it, the, I, don't, I don't remember what the, the number was, but people said it was impossible. And then within a year after he, the first guy broke the record, tons of other people did too, because everybody had set and believed the limitation that a four minute mile is not possible. Nope. And um, so that's the good thing with it. The, the bad thing is if you don't manage your mind well, which not many young kids are taught to, this was mostly instinctive for me. It was my escape from everything I had going on uh, in my life that was hard. It was, here was my escape, I, football, progress. What could I be? I could get to the NFL. I could make my way there uh, if, you know, if I stay at this. And um, that was really motivating. So don't get discouraged with where you're at right now. Know that if you stick to these strong habits of staying in the weight room, of working hard at whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, it doesn't have to be the weight room. Over time, you're going to get further and further and further away in the best way because you're going to be accelerating your growth from where you started. And that is the thing, that gain, not the gap of where you're trying to get to based on what everybody else is wanting to do. Don't worry about them. What do you want to do? You know, if it's a good thing, go after it. Constantly look back at where you started because it will motivate you when you're here. Because sometimes when you're here, you just feel like, oh, I've got so far to go. I can't, you know, I don't know if this is possible. And it's like, really? Look back there. You remember that? Yeah. Anything's possible. All right. <clears throat> Set two, uh, clearly I lowered the weight because I only hit four reps on 365. So this is 315, I'm gonna take it for a ride. Hopefully, ideally, I'd like to be able to get 10 reps. Let's see how it goes. Yep. We don't live in the ideal. We live in reality, which was eight reps today. I'll take a couple minutes off, do one more set right here. And then uh, go into the incline machine press. Get over here. Fatality. I'm going to adjust my grip. I was going a wider grip today. I was going my uh, middle, finger, middle finger on the first knurling, I think they call it, that smooth part in the middle of the rough part. I had been previously benching with my pinky on it. Let me see if that feels heavier or lighter comparatively. Ah, potentially heavier. Can't tell if I was just fatigued because I didn't rest that long or if it was that or both. 
We'll never know. Mostly, I, I just don't care enough. Yeah, very random thing to talk about and random way of getting there. But I really mean that. I don't care much about my bench press numbers anymore. I used to care a whole lot. And, uh, and now I don't. And the reason that's important is because the times that I, I cared the least, sometimes it would just, I would do better in it. Bench press may be a hard example for that one, but say for like, for acting, you go into an audition and you want it too much, you do worse. You can't relax, you can't be free in the moment. You can't let the little magical moments happen. You're too controlling, too st stuck to exactly how you prepared it. Can't make adjustments. And people smell it, they know it. Even if you try to hide it the best you can, if you if you're, have any hint of desperation on you, it's super unattractive. People don't want to be around it, makes them uncomfortable, makes them feel like they have to take care of you, makes them feel like you're not confident, uh, like you're not something that, you know, that they would really want to have because you want it too bad. Uh, so honestly, this is a weird thing, but for all of my auditions, I try to not really want it. Uh, and that really helps mentally. And maybe that's just a good principle for life in general. You know, you can't control the results anyways. So get to a place, and it's not that I don't want it, get to a place where I don't care. If I can get to that place where I don't care, but I'm having fun, boom, that's where it's at. You don't care and you're having fun doing it. You're gonna be the best you can possibly be, I promise. Because it's psych your, your psychology has so much to do with things. It's not about controlling everything. You, you can just flow, you can be there. Um, you'll unlock the best of your performance. I think in most things, when you can psychologically get to that place where you don't care and you just want to have fun. Little shout out, Rep Fitness. And uh, my favorite piece of equipment on my rep rack are these ISO lever arms, which you can literally create just about any machine you can think of in any weight room with these arms by manipulating just different things. So I'll show you, for example, the incline machine press. I set the uh, front rack extensions to you know the level where I can see 10 right here. Take these out of the lever, boom, lower it down. Bang. And then I'll just take the plates that I had off of my barbell bench. And I do two plates for my sets on the incline press. And this is just a slight incline press, but I found for myself, my body and my, my mechanics, it targets my upper chest very, very well. Um, so I'm gonna do the same on here. That's the coolest thing with the rep racks is it's all a connector set. So there's these holes a couple inches apart on every side of it. So I can stick a, a you know, dip bar on this side and then have a bar here and come over and do a, a set of something else over here. Um, you know, you can use your imagination. Dunzo, throw a couple plates on here. Bang. And then this bench right here is also a rep bench. What I'll do is just use, sorry, I didn't have my live on there. Um, the first level of incline is perfect for me for this setup. I'll raise the seat a little bit. Bang. Come out and then find a good distance for you. For me, it's right where the crack of my uh, gym flooring meets. That's just how I know to eye it. But when I'm down here, bring you down here with me. It's about like my hand is right in line kind of with my armpit right here. Ah. Ah. And I love this one because it gives such a, a deep stretch. Ooh. And again, targets that upper chest really well for me, which is hard for me to get because of the position of my sternum. I can turn almost anything into a flat bench or even a decline. Ah. 
Ich. Ich. Oh yeah. Oh. You want to see what a set to failure looks like? Oh, that's how a human fails. Slowly, not boom. Fight to the very end. So, Rep Fitness, these rack, this rack has been good to me. So has your other products. Just showing a little love. It's my setup. That's my favorite thing to do with the ISO lever arms. It's weird that I'm working out as hard as I am and I don't break a sweat most of the time. Um, partly because it's cold, it's winter time. During the summer in Tennessee, it's so humid, you're just in a sauna all the time. But right now, you know, I'm, I'm training for muscle growth. So I'm lifting heavy, taking longer rest sets, and tomorrow I'll be sore. I'll have all of the symptoms of, okay, you're growing in the areas that you're working. And yet it's weird because I'm not sweating sometimes hardly at all throughout the workout. And maybe I need to pace it up a little bit, but if I do, I'll get eight reps or, you know, or six reps on the next set instead of eight or 10. And uh, I think I could lead more muscle growth if I wait until I'm fully, mostly fully recovered and then hit the next set and get a better stimulus. So. <sighs> uh. That just came to me. Uh, regarding my point earlier where I was saying, man, I'm not even breaking a sweat during these workouts. You know, and you, your brain plays with you a little bit. Like, man, are you even working? It's like, yeah, I am. I'm building muscle and getting stronger and all those things. Uh, but I don't even need to shower after. It's just weird. But I think the point to all that is that a lot of people think that just because they're sweating that they're making gains. And they think the, the harder your legs shake and the more worn out you are aerobically, the better workout you got and that you're outworking other people. When aerobic training and training for sports, for explosiveness, athleticism, strength, power, is a very different ball game. It's not about how sweaty you get. Uh, you can get as sweaty as you want and just hit a stair climber and the treadmill all day long and be a dog tired and be like, oh, I got outworked everybody. And then you get slower because you're training yourself in a slow capacity, slow twitch muscles. If you don't touch those top end ranges of your speed and really push it, how do you expect your body to adapt and get faster? If you don't touch those big weights, and then push it and try to beat it the next time, how do you expect to get stronger? It's not a, just about what it looks like and you're all glistening and you're, you're panting and you know, you're looking around at everybody like you're, you're winning the game of working hard. You might be working hard, but you're probably not getting the results that you want in an athletic context if that's your singular focus. Now there's, there's times for that where it's, uh, it's very good and it's necessary when I think from my football experience, there are times, like say towards the end of the workout, you want to have a finisher. And it's not necessarily, it's not a strength context text. It's, it's like we had to do like weighted lunges for hundred yards or something. And people are given out. And if your knee touches the ground or you kind of pause for a second or give up, you start back again. And it was brutal. It really ingrained mental toughness in us. That's where that stuff's really good because you wanna make sure that you have guys that in the fourth quarter in overtime, you can count on those dudes to get it done when they're tired, to get it done when they're in pain,
to have the mental toughness and fortitude to not be selfish and to have accountability and, and do their job regardless of what it feels like. You know, that's you know, why I love our military and why I love how hard it is for the elite to become elite and how hard they push them to their breaking points because those are the people I want fighting for our country, fighting for our freedom, are the ones that are going to die before they quit. That's, that's what that stuff's good for in an athletic perspective. We're not getting probably to that place, obviously, but you want to push those boundaries so that, like in a couple videos ago, Derek was talking about, it's like, you start here, you get further and further away from that breaking point and how far you can take your body and how much you can say no to your brain trying to shut your body down. Um, that's where it's really good. But you don't want to do so much of that aerobic cardiovascular training that you're burning so many calories you can't eat them back. You're losing weight, you're losing strength gains, you're training your body too slow so you're, you're not getting those fast twitch movements and staying fast, explosive, strong, and powerful. So. Uh, that's my two cents on, on that, anyhow. Um, train for what you are specifically trying to go after. Chest is still feeling like it needs a little more rest time before um, I do those explosive plyometric push-ups. So I'm just going to do my uh, one set of lateral raise. It's really a few sets built into one. It's an exhaustion set. So I'm going to burn this out for a set. And then I'll show you what's after that. Okay, camera's falling. That's good. I gotta take a few seconds off, anyways. Here we go. Take about 10 seconds total off between these sets. Now hit five more is the goal. See, the burn still doesn't leave your shoulders. Ooh. That's good. Getting a lot in my traps too, which means I'm overcompensating. Getting, taking some pressure off the shoulders, but I don't work traps. And a little bit that's gonna happen anyway, so this gives me a little trap growth too. I'm in for it. I'll take the muscle building where I can where I can get it. All right. Ah. Eesh. Eesh. Ah. One more of those. Ah. 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 That's it. I'll often do exhaustion sets on body parts like that when it's not really the main focus of the lift. Like today's a push day but I want to get some lateral delt work in or some lateral raise side delt work in. But it's not the main focus and I'm not really into doing those. Uh, then I'll just do one big burnout set like that. Very time efficient. It's also something I'll do um, if I don't have much time for a workout. I got to take the, uh, the mic off for this because it's going to go flying all over the place. These are um, a plyometric push-up. Haven't done them in a minute. Uh, I'm kind of just curious to see if I still can. All right. All right, 
So, although today is a push day, I'm going to end the workout on my shirts and shorts muscles. I already hit the neck in the warm up. Y'all saw that, but I'm going to hit rope, tricep push downs, barbell curls, flat, uh, straight barbell, and then I'm going to come down here to the calf raise um, because I need to get extra volume in on the things that I'm specifically trying to focus on, mus growing the muscles on. So that is starting to need to look like based on the, the volume that I've been putting in, at least on my arms, has been effective. My arms have grown to over 18 inches now from the 17 and 5 8 starting point at the end of last year, at the end of December. And so, but the volume has been more than what I've been giving the calves in the neck. Those have been pretty stagnant. So I'm figuring, okay, I'm just going to start working my calves and my neck every day. Um, and a lot of the time, especially on the days I don't want to do it, I'll just throw it in my warm up. So I'll throw it at the end of my warm up. And it feels like, oh, I'm still just warming up and I don't need to really, you know, track this or make it some really organized, like, oh, build up and do these working sets. And no, I'm just kind of stressing the muscle, you know, and stressing it every day in different ways, light loads, heavy loads, but just trying to stay consistent and active with it. Because if I only hit them on leg days, you know, that's only going to happen every once every four or five days. And that's not enough to grow a stubborn muscle group, in my opinion, for, at least it's not for my calves. They haven't been growing that way. So um, that's what I'm doing here. Calves, biceps, and triceps. Let's get it. I've also noticed that, especially for like a, for something I'm, I'm working every single day, to do it in a less organized fashion makes it more sustainable for me, like mentally. It makes me not so just overloaded with the idea of it. Like, oh, I got to do calves again today. And like, oh, wait, what did I hit the last time? And then before that I did seated and I did how many sets and reps? It's like, no, just throw a weight on there and, and blast it out. You know, if today I'm not feeling like going heavy, I'll go lighter and just burn it out, do a bunch of reps. I'm not going to count them. I'm just going to take it to muscular failure. I'm not even going to count the reps or the, num the sets necessarily, maybe the sets, but I'm just going to focus on really working that muscle and not get ego driven on how, beating the reps or anything. I'm just going to push that muscle until it doesn't, doesn't go anymore. Um, because just trying to be too organized about every little thing, it, it burns you out. It exhausts you mentally and it creates more obstacles for me even wanting to get in the weight room in general. I'm only going to get like do two sets of biceps, triceps and calves, but I'm hitting that most days. So you add that up over a week. And uh, I'm getting a good amount of working sets. Let's get a cooler, let's get a cooler angle on that, huh? Get a little more tricep in there. Show the full horseshoe. Yahtzee. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Ish. Ah. I haven't done these in a while. I would imagine this is a lightweight. It's 60 pounds, uh, but we'll find out. Can't remember what I did last time with these. I've got a really bad right nostril itch. Try not to think about it, but I can't not. It's one of those ones that you vigorously rub your nose where someone might think you're about to break it. Ugh. But mind over matter, it doesn't itch. And the more I, I say that, the more it itches. Ah. Ah. Oh, yeah. Ah. Scratching that itch. Felt like the feeling have rust. 
on my salad fingers. Comment if you know what, what that's from. I've covered this before, but if you have especially stubborn calves like I have, this is what I do anyways. I get a steep incline um, slant board. Um, I lean forward as much as I can. I got something to rest on, press my thumbs against so I don't just fall forward. So I get an, a great, great stretch on the bottom and then you always wanna stay active and engaged on them. So I, I flex my glutes so it forces me to not bend at the knee and use other muscles. I just, boom, squeeze it up with the gastroc, slow down. It's almost like I'm pulling down with my anterior tibs, pause at the bottom three seconds and not just a total rest, but like you're having to stay engaged down there. Boom, fire back up. That's helped a little bit. I certainly got a lot stronger, minimal growth so far, but it takes a lot to grow my calves. So if y'all have any tips, hit me in the comments. Ooh. So that's why the next venture on these calves is to just hit them with way more frequency. Even if like, Today, for example, I'm just doing two working sets. You see me resetting, it's because I've slowly throughout these sets slide down the slant board. Uh. Uh. <sighs> Ish. All right. I think part of it with the calves also is that you're walking every day, you're walking all the time. Your calves are getting used constantly every step. And maybe that. I don't know, they just need more of a workload. And I can hit them more often, more volume, more intensity, and maybe they need that. You see like a lot of fat guys that are like super heavy, you know, like 400 pounds are pushing it and they have these jacked huge calves. And then especially if they lose weight, oh, what's the guy's name, Ethan something. Ethan, I know it, I'm just blanking right now because I'm all the bl blood is out of my brain, but he was a really overweight actor. Um, he was on Boy Meets World initially. He's done a bunch of stuff, but now he's dude's jacked. And uh, he's got these giant calves. He probably doesn't even work them. You know, they're just big from all those years of, you know, stepping up with all that weight. <clears throat> Battery's about to die, so if it does, I'm not gonna go get another one. I just got one more set of these three exercises. You get it. Ooh. Ah. 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 All right. Yeah, it's giving me that blinking sim signal. We're probably out of here in no time. In case I don't see you today, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Back at it with another odd post-workout shake. Just four ingredients. We got 16 ounces of egg whites, already in there. Putting that on the food scale, we're going another eight ounces of the Fairlife 2% uh, reduced fat chocolate milk. Boom. We actually, no, we're gonna just, uh, we don't need the peanut butter because, so it's three ingredients. Thin Mint Girl Scout cookies, eight of them. That's gonna be 320 calories. Again, just three ingredients, egg whites, 2% chocolate milk, Thin Mint Girl Scout cookies. It's 700 calories, 
about 65 grams of protein and about uh, 55 grams of carbs, I think about, something like that. Um, that's one, two, three, one, four, six, seven. boom. Throw those in there with some ice. Yeah, come here, bud. You can be in the in the camera with me. Yeah, I will. I'm gonna pour this real quick. Oh, that's good. You wanna try a sip, bud? It's really yummy. I don't. I don't want. You wanna? No. Okay. You don't have to. It's got the cookies in it we ate last night. Try. I'm trying. You want some of your own? No? Okay. It is good. 